since uh, the Second World War, we have witnessed uh, uh, very dramatic situations with millions of people displaced and which dramatic humanitarian needs. The donor community was not organized as it is today and the result was sometimes help would come late. It was a totally diff different world. First of all, communication technology were not there and so every communication was much too slow. It was a period, in fact, they are compared to nowadays, you had very few humanitarian actors. We threw the, the food at a problem, we uh, threw some doctors at a, at a hospital, but we did not have the holistic view. Providing humanitarian aid 20 years ago could be an ad hoc and hazardous affair that often relied on the enthusiasm of its operatives rather than organization and technology. But things were changing, and in 1992, the European Commission set up the European Humanitarian Aid Department, called ECHO, and its task was specifically to provide and coordinate emergency relief funding for victims of natural disasters and armed conflicts around the world. Europeans who really hold strong on the value of solidarity felt that we had to come to the rescue in a more organized, more effective way, and that was the birth of ECHO. ECHO was soon to be tested, as the Balkans was engulfed in internecine warfare, creating an unprecedented humanitarian and refugee crisis. Sarajevo was completely surrounded. Nobody could go out, nobody could enter, apart from the humanitarian aid. So we didn't have any, no, nothing to eat, absolutely nothing. That was, there was a period when people started to eat grass. So it was fundamental for us to receive this humanitarian aid. It was not only a huge humanitarian challenge in assistance terms where ECHO played an important role. It was also a huge challenge in, in, in protection terms. The conflict was a steep learning curve for the organization, working out how to stay impartial and still deliver help to the most vulnerable. This ability to be neutral was severely tested in many places, but no more so than when a million refugees from Rwanda, many of which were implicated in the genocide, fled to camps in the surrounding countries. There was always the effects on the, on the young children who were, you know, they, they, they're too young to have any sort of political ideas or agendas or anything like that. They're totally innocent victims of, of of, you know, of what the adults did. But the forces of Mother Nature herself can cause as much suffering as man's violence upon man. From earthquakes to tsunamis, the challenges are varied. For ECHO and its partners, speed of reaction is what saves lives. When Haiti was hit by the earthquake in 2010, Petit Frere found his daughter injured in the rubble. Luckily for him, one of Echo's partners, Médecins Sans Frontières, was on the scene. Le docteur Pézuzi a signé pour que l'enfant doit aller chez les Antilles à Martinique pour que mon enfant apprenne plus de soins pour lui. This kind of swift support often means the difference between life and death, and the Commission in 2001 introduced arrangements that could give rapid access to up to 3 million euros within 72 hours. On pouvait obtenir une dérogation et que cette dérogation nous permettait d'être rapide et d'agir très rapidement. Et c'est pour ça qu'on est, on est allé dans ce sens et ça a été effectivement une, euh, quelque chose qui a fait une différence. In 2010, another key support was added to the ECHO toolbox when the EU civil protection mechanism was brought under ECHO's remit, giving access to specialist teams and equipment for crises both within and outside Europe. The mechanism's operational heart is the Monitoring and Information Center in Brussels. Here, requests for aid are married with the capabilities both on the ground and elsewhere. The eyes and ears of ECHO are the humanitarian experts based in the field. They assess and liaise with the partner organizations. I think what distinguishes ECHO from many other donors is the quality of the people on their staff. Uh, their staff, most of whom have worked in NGOs, really know the field. Our people on the ground in, in many of the situations we face 
can have a dialogue with ECHO and uh, uh, interact. Uh, and that interaction is sometimes extremely important even for the definition of our own strategies, of our own policies, and of the response uh, we are able to mobilize uh, to the crisis we face. But the threats to the most marginalized of the world are increasing and becoming more complex, from climate change to population growth to access itself. There are more and more cases when we need to build links between relief and development. And this is where we find ourselves actually not being so good today and, and, and we require much more effort from both the humanitarians and the development community to be effective for the challenges of tomorrow. It's about creating resilient societies. The best you can do is actually to make sure that people are prepared, that they have a knowledge about the risks that they're facing, uh, and, and with that knowledge and this preparation, they actually suffer much less. This resilience takes many forms, from education to disaster preparedness to sustainable agricultural techniques. But communities all over the world are rising to the challenge, and with the help of the Commission and ECHO's partners, building their own support mechanisms to help prevent, prepare and respond to the next crisis. ECHO has grown from an office with 40 personnel to one of the world's leading players in crisis relief with an annual budget of more than 1 billion euros. During its 20 years it has helped millions of crisis hit victims in over 140 countries working with more than 200 partners providing a vast range of help from food, healthcare, shelter and water through to education and psychological support. But above all, ECHO stands as a flagship of European solidarity with the world's most needy. Being able to witness, and not only as a witness, but as, a, but as an actor of change, it's an immense privilege.